today's video, I want to talk about the biggest reason that I believe I've been successful and hopefully you guys incorporating this will lead to much greater success for yourselves as well. So I call my biggest strategy talent cycling. What this involves is trading players to other teams for younger, better players that I think are undervalued. So it doesn't matter how expensive a player is or how cheap they are, I should say. Uh, or how good a player on my team is. Essentially, if I think a player on my team is overvalued, I'm almost certainly going to try to trade them. If I see a player on another team that's undervalued, no matter how good or bad I think they are, I'm likely going to try to acquire them. And I use this philosophy a whole lot. Uh, it's particularly important to me that I am making sure that my team is constantly getting younger. Now, what this means is I essentially almost never want my players to reach free agency. If a player hits free agency, you're getting nothing in return for them. They are just now losing uh, out on your organization. So the way I'm going to put this is be constantly building your organization. Do not worry about your MLB team as the primary goal. Worry about the overall talent level of your organization. So if you're overpaying for a player, that means that you're uh, overall organizational talent level has declined and there are certain circumstances where that might be acceptable but I'll get to that later. Generally speaking when you make a trade the primary goal is to improve your organization in some way or another or it's to acquire a hyper talented player which I'm going to get to it a little bit. So we're going to start this off with some examples of these traits and generally they are going to involve acquiring prospects since that is the primary way to get younger. You're going to see a lot of prospects or players who have a very minute amount of major league service time on this list. So the first trade that I want to go over here is acquiring Alec Bohm from the Philadelphia Phillies. Now you see that today Alec Bohm is the number 23 prospect in baseball. He's got a pretty interesting power based profile offensively, really strong first base defense. He's having a decent year in AAA so far. So how exactly did I manage to acquire this player? Well, we've got here that he's not the only guy I got in this trade. Spencer Howard was another notable acquisition. Now, I've since traded him and I think I traded him again and then traded back for him. But uh, he was a big part of this deal. I also acquired two major league ready relief pitchers who were both at the time very talented. Betancourt's still in my organization and provides pitching depth. Leftwich was a great reliever for me for a year and then a very big trade chip. And uh, we can't go over that trade later, but for the meantime, I'm just going to focus on this one. Um, and what I gave up to get Bohm and Howard along with the relievers were a couple of major leaguers for the most part. Jake Lamb, an overpriced, overvalued MLB player. Andy Yerzy, a no-name prospect. Deone Rodriguez, another no-name prospect. And Geraldo Perdomo, who is not bad, but is nowhere near the caliber of the players I acquired in the deal. So essentially, I'm trading an overvalued older major leaguer and some overvalued prospects for some undervalued prospects. Howard and the two relievers were very undervalued, along with Canelo, the shortstop I got in this deal. Bohm was not super undervalued, but he was a high caliber younger player, so he was still very high up on my uh, list of players to acquire. And his value has since increased since the deal, since obviously he's continued to develop and reach his potential. So um, acquiring younger players, check. Getting rid of older players on contracts I don't necessarily want to pay, check. So big win for me there. That's definitely a very talent cycle type move. My next trade I want to go over is I acquired a package of players from the Houston Astros that included most notably Seth Beer, a top prospect at the time with a quite well-rounded and overall talented hitting profile. I have, of course, since traded him, but that's a separate note. So the big parts of this deal we're sending Zach Greinke to the Astros. Uh, ironic, since he actually did go to the Astros in real life in 2019. Uh, but I'm looking here at a major league pitcher who was okay, certainly close to the front of your rotation, but making $30 million a year, much more than I wanted to pay for him. And just who's overvalued by this organization. I also threw in two random players to help complete this one. Jimmy Scherfe, a mediocre reliever, uh, who has since improved, but who was mediocre at the time. And Jose Herrera, a mediocre catching prospect with a bad personality. I acquired a very undervalued first baseman in Yuli Gurriel. 
Uh, he's declined since I've traded him and traded back for him a couple of times, but he had some pretty solid hitting ratings and slotted in nicely for me for a while. Brandon Bielek, a solid starting pitcher. Of course, Seth Beer, I thought the Astros undervalued him, a very talented hitting prospect. Brett Adcock was just a reliever in the deal, and Ryan Presley was another significant name, a bigger reliever that I thought could add to my bullpen and later get good trade value, which he did. So the talent cycling, the big parts here, I, I acquired an undervalued player, I acquired a top prospect, I acquired another undervalued player, and I acquired a player that I knew I could trade later for an even better value. Next trade that we're going to go over here. I acquired Keston Hura from the Milwaukee Brewers as the premier piece of this, along with Corbin Burns, a nice starting pitcher who I almost immediately traded because his trade value was so much higher to other teams. Mike Moustakas, a very good third baseman. McCobb Bello, a solid pitcher, or not pitching, just normal prospect. And Mercio Dubon, a very nice utility guy. So Hira is, of course, a top prospect. He was already well up on the list at the time, but is now the number six overall prospect or something like that for his hitting chops. I, in return, sent over Ryan Presley, who I just acquired from the Astros, but is, of course, much more heavily valued from the Brewers. Nick Ahmed, a solid shortstop, but somebody I was looking to replace anyway. And then uh, Adam Jones, a garbage center fielder on a larger pro uh, contract. I had no interest in keeping him around, and I was very surprised I could get anything for him. And Wilder Patino, a decent prospect, but certainly nothing like any of these players. So I would consider literally pound for pound, every single player in here is better than every single player I gave up, except perhaps Dubone to Presley or Ahmed. But uh, definitely a bigger win for me. So we got the top prospect. We got the undervalued players in Dubone, Burns, and Moustakas. And then we got another solid young prospect who has the potential to improve in Billow. So we got the players that we can trade later, the players that could contribute to our organization in the meantime, and some decent young prospects as well. And that's really what it is all about. We're looking to improve the health of our organization. This trade accomplishes that better than most of the other ones I did. Next up, I acquired Luis Guillaume from the New York Mets. Um, in a deal that also included a top pitching prospect, David Peterson, who was undervalued at the time. Uh, a couple of other interesting pitchers, Justin Wilson was probably the most notable. Eric Handhold's still in my organization, is decent depth. And in return, I sent over a whole bunch of mediocre prospects that literally meant absolutely nothing to my organization. So this is a case where it's okay to trade prospects, and... I do advocate for this. If you have a player who's not going to be useful to your organization, trade them away. Trade them for players who will be useful. Uh, David Peterson, at the time, was a very good-looking pitching prospect. All of these relievers were pretty solid, and Guillaume has turned into essentially the best second baseman in the league uh, since this trade was made. He costed me next to nothing, and now he's one of the most valued players in the organization in the league, but I've also got him. Notably, he was a younger player, so I signed him to a very team-friendly extension, and he's now going to be sticking around with my organization for eight years on very little money to be a highly talented player. He just won the Gold Glove at second base in his first year, so you've got to love that deal. Uh, adding a top player or somebody who became a top player for next to nothing is always something you want to look to do. You see a guy like Yorme, somebody who looks like they could be much better than being valued. You absolutely have got to jump at that. So the next one we got on the list is a significant deal with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, where is this one? I'll just pull up one of the players involved, Julio Arias, and he was the centerpiece of the deal. Oh yeah, I've traded him since, so... We'll just go into his history here. So he was traded from the Dodgers to us, along with a top prospect, Alex Verdugo, a decent pitcher, Ross Stripling, and their, another top prospect in Will Smith. So I have no interest in Will Smith at this point, but I know his value is going to increase, so I acquired him anyways in the deal. And we got... Uh, or we gave up, rather, Madison Bumgarner, a solid pitcher, but on a one-year deal, and making a good amount of money. Ray Black, a reliever I thought the Dodgers overvalued significantly. Nick Solak, a decent prospect, but somebody who was unlikely to make too much of a difference. Will Smith, another reliever on a one-year contract. And Brandon Bielak, who I thought they were overvaluing. Two really low-down uh, really low down draft picks. 
And what we got in return was just kind of ridiculous, in my opinion. Julio Arias had frontline starter potential. I knew he was going to be loved by the rest of the league, so I was shocked that they were willing to give him to me for Madison Bumgarner and Ray Black. I only had to throw in these three guys, who I didn't really think were that much, to acquire Verdugo, Stripling, and Smith in the deal. Uh, Verdugo, at the time, was a top prospect. He got ridiculous trade value for me when I eventually sent him to the Angels. Stripling was a nice pitcher. I think for a little bit, and he got trade value as well. And then Will Smith, of course, was an awesome trade chip for me. So just overall, a great way to improve the organization. A lot of talent coming back for very little going over. If you can get a deal like this, you have got to jump on it. Guys on one-year deals, guys who just are not that good, you trade them away and get literal star-level talent or players that will be perceived as star-level talent, you just have got to jump on that. All right, the next deal that we've got here uh, is acquiring Clark Schmidt from the New York Yankees. So it should be around here somewhere. I know it happened a little bit later. Yep, here we go. So Clark Schmidt was a top prospect, and I was surprised I could get him at all. So I sent over a really terrible pitcher, Jason Vargas. Ross Stripling was the centerpiece. So again, that over or undervalued player I just acquired from the Dodgers, he's immediately getting me a good return from the Yankees. And then another random older player who just had no value to my organization. And in return, I'm getting a good rangy uh, utility infielder type player and a guy who turned into one of the uh, top pitching prospects in the game very quickly. You can see Clark Schmidt has a load of talent here. Um, I do believe he's on the top prospects list, but I don't remember where he is, and he is way valued from teams, so he could be a trade chip for me this year. But a lot of talent for next to nothing. That's exactly what I'm talking about for that organization building stuff. And then the next ones are the benefits of doing this talent cycling. So if you do this, I've got three deals that will show you exactly how good it can be. You can do stuff like this. So I send over a couple of players that I have who are very talented. Shohei Otani, the two-way phenom. He is still really good at this point in time, uh, since this is an OTP 20 game, or yeah, OTP 20 game import. So he's got really good pitching ratings, really strong batting ratings. AJ Puck, a top pitching prospect. Daniel Espino, another top pitching prospect, and Tristan McKenzie, yet another top pitching prospect. I have so much pitching depth that really, out of these guys, I'd expect these three to be decent pitchers towards the bottom of my rotation with McKenzie having the most upside at the time, but they're still expendable to me. And Otani has been a decent part of my organization, but he's definitely worth giving up for Vladimir Herrero Jr. So... Because I did my talent cycling and I managed to acquire some top players, I'm able to flip them for the guy who's the best hitter in the game. And uh, yeah, this is really where you're looking at your biggest benefits for talent cycling. Because you have so much talent, so much depth in your organization, you could afford to trade anybody at any time and get some ridiculously good players back for them. So I've got a couple other cases of this. We have a trade that I acquired Nolan Arenado completely retained. I have him by mops as the best player in this league, which is saying a lot, but his defense and offense are just ridiculous. So I talent cycled some players over for Mookie Betts. I acquired Ryan McMahon earlier from the Rockies. I acquired Josh Bell undervalued from the Pirates. I acquired, or, uh, John Brevia was just a reliever I thought they liked too much, and Mark Melanson, same deal. And they were willing to give me Nolan Arenado and retaining his entire contract of eight years. So now I'm paying Arenado nothing on what would have been a $35 million year to be arguably one of the best players in the National League, if not all of baseball. Speaking of the National League, Mike Trout is no longer an AL player. He has since been acquired from the Angels. Again, a talent cycling base deal. I'm able to flip a lot of the excess talent in my organization for a superstar level player. So I'm sending over, um, I'm taking on Zach Kozert's contract, first of all, part of his contract, since he's a really bad deal for the Angels. And I'm sending over no Syndergaard, a superstar level pitcher, but just not necessarily needed my organization. I have since reacquired him. Victor Victor Mesa, a very talented center fielder. Don't really need him, though, if I'm acquiring Mike Trout. Blake Walston, 
a, a pitching prospect, I felt like they overvalued. Jesse Weaker, who was a solid hitter, but again, not really needed in my organization since I've got other options. And Luis Castillo, a very good pitcher, but again, I have the ability to trade them since I have so much pitching talent at this point that uh, giving up some of these players is just worth it for Mike Trout, 65% retained. Trout is another insane level player. He is, in my opinion, underperforming at this point in the year and still on pace for 10.2 war, which is just insane. Uh, the benefits of talent cycling honestly just cannot be overstated. Being able to get these players, it just, it's a huge deal. And then another thing I want to talk about here is how I acquired Lance McCullers Jr. from the Houston Astros. And I took on a bad contract, Josh Reddick. So this is something I strongly recommend. And Reddick honestly isn't that bad of a hitter or fielder, so he wouldn't have been terrible playing on my team. But a big part of talent cycling is taking on bad contracts because teams will give you some very talented players for them. So if you have extra money, rather than going out and signing a free agent, you take on somebody terrible and acquire somebody better. And uh, that's literally giving up nothing to add a massive amount of talent to your organization. I did the same thing to acquire Aaron Judge from the Yankees. I took on Jacoby Ellsbury's contract, and I was able to trade him later, stupidly enough. But I got uh, Chad Green, a top relief pitcher, and Aaron Judge, one of the most highly valued hitters in the whole game, for next to nothing. Table scraps. And that's that's the whole talent cycling thing. If you can just think of it as your organization has X amount of talent, and you can trade generally players for players of similar talent level in a one for one but if you keep trading for players who are better then your organization's talent keeps increasing you keep getting younger you keep getting more talented players and eventually you're going to have an organization that's just completely broken and insane this is my second year and i can confidently say that i have probably 80 percent of the top players and prospects in the league that are actually going to be talented because i talent cycled hyper quickly to get all of them now you play out 50 years or so in a save not even let's say 15 years and you should be able to acquire literally any player at any time just based on who you've got in your organization without giving up anything critical uh, the benefits of talent cycling are immeasurable you can see that i am currently on a pace to win more than 120 games this season that's commonplace you should be able to sustain 120 well okay maybe not everybody if Especially if you're still learning how to trade super effectively and you're not investing necessarily as much time as I do into every single trade, you should be able to sustain probably 100 to 110 wins, no problem, every year. Uh, even if you're building on a completely different philosophy than me, talent cycling is the best way to get long term success within an organization. I really hope this helps you out. I really hope that you guys adopt this strategy. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you guys on the next video.